Good morning or good day to everyone joining us. My name is Scott Martin. I'm the North American co-chair for World Urban Parks. Thank you for joining us on our continuing series of uh, some of the innovations, explorations, and discoveries going on in the urban footprint. And we are very excited, delighted, in fact, to have some peers and colleagues of mine from here in Louisville um, and New York City, not my colleague city, uh, to talk about their discoveries and their work at making our cities more livable. So uh, just a point of order, um, if you are on and you have questions, uh, please enter those into the Q&A box and the panelists will be taking a look as they go forward. Uh, this will be recorded and you will see a packet that will come out from Maggie and our partners at Indiana University in a couple days. Um, and if we don't get to your questions, no sweat, send those in. I'm sure we'll get the panelists to address those if we can uh, in the final package that goes out to you. Quick uh, reminder for World Urban Parks, we are the global collaboration of park leaders and green space thinkers who really get excited about learning from each other. Um, and we encourage you to consider joining our group. It's a totally casual group of folks, uh, but some really exciting exchanges. Um, our, our membership is, is very affordable and we've got a bunch of programs coming up but it's really about folks that believe in the power of cities uh, to be great places for people and wildlife and the quality of life. A quick map here, this kind of shows you the representation of our active board members in the North American community. And this map is replicated across the globe as you can imagine. So we'd love to have you join this collaboration because the big lesson is as we watch COVID spread globally across the world with incredible speed, innovation spreads likewise for parks and green spaces as do challenges. So the more we can share, uh, the more we learn. Upcoming events, just to make you aware of if you're curious and learning more, um, one of our initiatives is the National Park Cities concept uh, that Daniel's leading out of London. Uh, next Thursday, they have a Zoom meeting that'll be introducing this. And this is a global event that'll move around the globe, uh, celebrating National Park Cities and what's going on across the globe to make cities more livable and enjoyable. I encourage you to participate in that. And then coming up at the end of November is, ta-da, a virtual conference. None of us have heard of that before. Um, so instead of being in Albania, uh, we are going to be hosted by their mayor. And their mayor is tremendous. If you want to Google this guy, Arion, he is awesome um, in terms of a passionate view of the, the positivity of futures. And doing it in Albania um, with the challenges they have really makes all of us step back and think our world is, really has a lot of hope in it. So November 20th through 27th, um, I'll put these links in the chat box during the speech, during the talk as well. Love to get you to submit your information if you're interested in submitting an abstract for presentation and registration as well, because this will be a multi-day deal, but won't be all day in front of a computer. It'll be spaced out. So we'll post that for you as well. And then in our series of webinars coming up next will be Parks for All presentation by our friends CJ and Dawn from up in Canada. Uh, that'll be on November 12th. We'll get that information out to you as well to kind of see how our Canadian friends up north uh, do this thing called collaborative and systemic urban space and park planning. Particular attention and exciting to me up there is how they've engaged the First Nations um, and the indigenous communities into that dialogue as well. So another interesting presentation. There's the links. I'll put all of it up there. You guys didn't come to hear me. You came to hear these brilliant, smart researchers. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Ted Smith. I'll save the bio except to say Ted appreciates good coffee and good bourbon, which makes him a native Louisvillian by fault. Um, and Ted, I will stop sharing my screen and shut the heck up and let your brilliant team take it from here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can start sharing my screen and we can keep going here. Okay, are you able to see my screen and hear me? All good. All right, well, um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to join this uh, great group today. Um, I am... Uh, I'm going to do the starter course, the appetizer uh, on a, what I hope will be a great um, journey for us all. Uh, for some, it may feel a little repetitive, um, but I hope that we'll conclude with a, maybe a, a greater understanding of what the gap is between you know, what we feel emotionally and sentimental about and what we know empirically and factually. And so uh, I'm, I'm here today uh, representing the University of Louisville uh, School of Medicine. The Christina Lee Brown and Byram Institute. Um, our focus is on uh, environmental medicine, uh, which is a, a part of medicine that uh, really focuses on um, not what the chemistry inside your body is about, but the world around you and how that interacts with your physiology to create health or disease. 
And so it should be no surprise that sooner or later, people in environmental medicine um, uh, get excited about uh, looking for environmental circumstances that uh, reduce disease burden or promote good health. And so um, in the appetizer version of the, the presentation today, before my colleagues uh, deliver the main course, I thought we could just start with the empirical uh, basis for our uh, intuitive understanding that being in nature and around nature is good for our health. So this is gonna be a 30,000 foot view and then uh, Dr. Spohr and Dr. Hart will, uh, will help us with um, very specific applications of uh, some of this learning. So one of these things that um, when you say it out loud, um, you then become indignant. So I'll say it out loud, living near greenness and near green places uh, absolute, absolutely reduces all cause uh, mortality or increases all cause living, decreases mortality, all causes, right? Cancer, depression, you know, anything you can think of, cardiovascular disease. So 150 peer reviewed publications later, we uh, continue to document that living near green places uh, is good for your health. And yet uh, 150 publications later, we are not changing uh, public health practices uh, necessarily globally and certainly not uh, here in the United States to somehow incorporate these learnings. So I just wanna open with, there's been more than enough research that demonstrates a relationship between living in green places, living near green spaces and good health outcomes. So let's just go through a little bit of why um, why we think those associations exist, and then what it would take to actually deliver the kind of evidence uh, that I think will move public policy and even private health markets for, for that matter. So when we think about living near greenness, the research that I mentioned really does focus on proximity to greenness. And, and so not specifically any kind of greenness. Now there are lots of studies that take parts and pieces of it, but in our sort of view of this uh, from a clinical perspective, you know, we can think about um, nature, green places that are, you know, far away. So, you know, if you've got a mountain range visible out your window, that's great. You know, if you see a forest, you know, off in the distance, that's fantastic. There are health benefits to you by having nature visible even at a distance. Uh, then you can think about uh, those environments that we create and curate, uh, like parks are a fantastic example, um, as are streetscapes and other, uh, other places that, again, are, uh, are not necessarily where you live, but are in, your, um, uh, in the environment that you move around. And so that social environment that we construct, which we've, you know, in a rapidly urbanizing world, we've crowded with as much stuff as we can construct and left sometimes a little bit of room for nature. Um, when we're really intentional about it, that is a space that is important because as you bring nature closer than that mountain range or that forest, we get even more health benefit. And then the personal environment, you know, that like think about what might be in your backyard, think about plants in your house. Um, we know that uh, that has great benefit. And so um, that's you know nearby nature, you know, in your personal environment. So uh, for us as as researchers, you know, the, the fundamental finding is proximity to greenness at all scales confers some health value, and um, that there is no particular uh, uh, range, if you will, that that matters sort of more than another at this point in time with our understanding. So we're really working, uh, you know, across the spectrum and in cities. And so uh, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more from Dr. Hart about the specifics of a project that we're doing. Uh, and you'll hear from Dr. Spohr about how all cities you know, can be working with this information. So let's talk about what, what gets in the way of um, a definitive understanding of uh, this relationship. It's a correlation and we all know the correlation uh, doesn't imply causation. And so then we have to sort of put on the table all sorts of things that could be that could explain this relationship. And so um, it is completely plausible that people who live near green spaces uh, are um, more physically active, right? They may go for walks because their environment is, is so conducive and pleasing. 
and uh, that, that encourages them to get out and about, right? And so it's a completely plausible uh, scenario. And I know the people in the parks uh, industry, uh, you know, know this well, that, you know, uh, cities that have parks near where people live, you know, do, uh, do get people out of their homes and, and out, out and about. So physical activity is, uh, is a, certainly a, a real key to disease reduction. And so you can explain theoretically some of the health benefit of nature by its encouragement of physical activity. But then of course it competes with any other thing that you can think of that would make you physically active. So then there's, a, there's a, another dimension of the argument that is, um, well, these green places do uh, confer um, a social benefit in that you, know, you may be more likely to go for a walk with someone or meet someone, for example, at a park. And um, there are real clinical benefits to social cohesion. And so that is one avenue of explaining, again, this all-cause mortality uh, improvement is, you know, perhaps it's uh, you're getting, uh, it's encouraging another benefit, which is social cohesion. And again, there are other ways to uh, get social cohesion in someone's uh, life, right? We could have a community center where we have regular gatherings or whatever it may be, it doesn't need to be in nature. So that that's a, a trick in the interpretation. Then we can look at mental health. And um, you know, there are plenty of studies that show um, good effects on behavioral health, um, reductions in anxiety, reductions in depression. And um, again, if you're looking at mortality, um, uh, behavioral health is a mediator. And so, you know, depressed people have a much higher um, uh, likelihood of earlier death than people that aren't depressed. And so uh, you can get into this um, mixture of, is it really, uh, is nature an antidepressant? And if nature is an antidepressant, again, we have to think about all the other ways that we can treat um, uh, uh, behavioral health and uh, nature may be one of them. So again, we have to keep thinking about all, all the dimensions here. We can talk about cognition and there's more than enough evidence, correlational evidence that shows, you know, being in nature, around nature um, improves cognition and attention. And we know that, uh, you know, sort of metabolically in the brain, if we can keep the brain very active, uh, there's all sorts of um, uh, protective benefit there. So uh, again, I'll throw the, and there are other ways to get a cognitive improvement that aren't in nature. So we have to, again, think about that. Okay, so stress reduction. So we know that people spend time in nature, um, report lower stress, uh, not only immediately contemporaneously while they're in nature, but at later points in time after they've been uh, in nature. And so we know that stress is a, is a, a, a chronic disease risk uh, factor. All the inflammatory diseases have <clears throat> problems uh, that can be exacerbated by risk, I'm sorry, by stress. And uh, so, and again, we can think about other ways of, of reducing stress that aren't in nature. So I'm gonna give you the whole tour. So we'll get to our punchline here. Um, the interesting thing is uh, there's a whole line of research that, um, that essentially says, well, just looking at green spaces uh, reduces stress. And um, there are certainly studies with synthetic nature, right? So the space program has been actively trying to figure out how you just give astronauts, you know, virtual reality experiences where they're in synthetic nature and some of the benefit can be achieved in synthetic nature. And so, um, you know, what is it about nature and stress? Is, is it something that is strictly a visual experience or is it something more uh, global? Uh, we know that some specific conditions that are, are real disease burdens in the developed world, like asthma, um, are uh, in some ways um, improved by early childhood exposure to environments that are rich with biogenic material like pollens and other microbes. And so um, we know that um, the burden of respiratory disease early in life uh, and the throughout life is a real risk factor for many, many other um, chronic diseases. And so, you know, you could paint the picture that time in nature is really part of, um, uh, you know, reducing some other kind of chronic disease that ultimately complicates uh, your health. There's a broader field that I think many of us are familiar with, and, and it sort of comes under the heading of um, biophilia that uh, E.O. Wilson and others made famous many years ago. 
and this idea that our physiologies co-evolved with a larger ecology. And so um, people who grow up in environments that are not biodiverse um, are more likely to have autoimmune uh, diseases. And um, when the immune function is failing, and I don't need to tell anybody that in the middle of the pandemic, when the immune function is failing, all sorts of other organ systems in the body um, are immediately compromised and um, it really does decrease lifespan uh, to have an immune system that is uh, not optimally functioning. And so if you think about what uh, our immune system requires, our immune system is anticipating uh, a training set early in life and throughout life we are challenged by our environment and the, the various wide range of challenges that we're exposed to uh, create a resilient, uh, we think of it as a high immune tone immune system. And so our physiology is expecting everything else. And so the hypothesis uh, uh, that I love, the old friends hypothesis that our physiology, our genes have co-evolved with hundreds of thousands of other uh, organisms and um, we, uh, we want their presence and we expect their presence physiologically. And so um, when we think about uh, the benefits of nature, it's very difficult to ignore this very fundamental co-evolution, you know, this big crowd. So think of yourself as living in a terrarium. You think about all the things that you need to survive. You need a lot of other living organisms to uh, survive in a healthy fashion. I just wanna focus um, just in closing on really um, the work that inspires us. And you're gonna hear from Dr. Hart in a little bit about our ambitious project to essentially try to clear the, clear the air, clear the fog. If I gave you, a, a, you know, six or seven possible explanations for how nature could be improving health and, and all of those explanations, you know, relate to uh, mediating variables, you know, whether it's anxiety, whether it's, um, stress, whatever, you know, what these, uh, these factors that could explain the mortality outcome that aren't nature itself, we want to really focus on what specifically in nature uh, could reduce disease burden. And so we are focused on cardiovascular research here at the University of Louisville, and we have a, a great um, long track record in working on cardiovascular mechanistic pathways. And so when we look at cardiovascular disease specifically, uh, we see tremendous effects just on cardiovascular disease risk. And we see this at the country level, at the city level, at the census block level, and into the backyard of a person level. So we see cardiovascular protective benefit at all levels of proximity to greenness and of a significant effect size, right? One that you could say could compare um, to a pharmaceutical intervention. And this is gonna be important for, for our work. Um, we, we have seen in a very clinical um, interpretation um, how spending time in nature has been restorative in a clinical sense. And so people who have suffered strokes have recovered faster and to a higher level when they have been in nature than when they haven't. And so we know we are administering some kind of medication, if you will, uh, for those folks who have suffered strokes. Well, we also know that, um, that th there's a differential effect. And so that we know that for women, uh, there's a higher benefit statistically for time in nature. And we know that in pharmaceutical interventions, there are differences in uh, sex and effects of these medications. So we're starting to have something that's feeling like an intervention. The last thing I think is interesting to note is if we just look at cardiovascular disease mortality and something very global, like the presence of um, the ash tree, we know that in certainly in North America, as the emerald ash borer moved south, that uh, as those trees left, uh, disease, cardiovascular disease um, incidents went up. And, you know, for every year of uh, tree loss, you know, we see tremendous increases in cardiovascular disease um, mortality. And so that gives us a lot of pause that what we really are looking at is something that, um, you know, is either a, a, a medication or some sort of prophylactic. And I will throw the whole model on the table and then I will tell you uh, where we ended up. But there are many 
physiological mechanisms in cardiovascular disease risk that um, a lot of nature nearby uh, could confer to you. And we've talked about some of them earlier in the talk, but what we're gonna focus on in our work is air pollution. And the reason that we are uh, very focused on air pollution with our work uh, that Dr. Hart will share with you is um, we have a very good understanding from another couple hundred or thousand studies on air pollution and cardiovascular disease risk that if we can make small changes in exposure to air pollution, we can make big changes in uh, health outcomes. And so um, our hypothesis going into our Green Heart Project that Dr. Hart will tell you about um, is really focused on um, we believe that greenness uh, removes air pollution, this is our hypothesis, and that we will decrease cardiovascular disease risk as me measured with subclinical biomarkers, you know, um, arterial stiffness and, and other biomarkers. And so um, if we can demonstrate the bioequivalence of nature on the same scale that you would put a statin or some other intervention to help somebody stay well, all of a sudden we're having a, a sort of a common currency conversation about nature and health. And that to me, I think is a really important uh, evolution of this work to get beyond sort of talking about how good nature is for you in general terms and get to some very specific kinds of frameworks that are on the same kind of um, scale of evidence that we, that we put medical procedures and uh, drugs on. And so um, I'm gonna wrap here. I just wanna give you the, the teaser that, um, you know, instead of spending this whole presentation talking about what we're doing in Louisville, Kentucky, I'm delighted that uh, Dr. Spore is gonna be with us to uh, really help us see what those opportunities are across, uh, certainly across the United States in, in the work that he does. It's important to us that we can start thinking about and planning for green equity. And, you know, if, if we get green benefit, then that benefit should be enjoyed by all. And so uh, that's my teaser to, uh, to his presentation. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you and we'll keep moving along. Great, well, good uh, morning, everyone. I'm going to put my slides up here. Uh, this also comes with a bit of a personal story for me. I. I moved, I'm in New York City and I moved from a part of the city that has low greenness to a part of the city that has high greenness in the final moments of my dissertation. And while moving during that time was certainly a gamble. I remember walking through green parts after of the city after a long night of coding and feeling relief, feeling relieved that I could look at something that was not a computer or a sidewalk. And though anecdote is not evidence, this certainly connected for me. And I've been, I've been hearing the good news about greenness from Ted for a long time now and um, believing it more and more as I hear more of it from him. So my name's uh, Ben, uh, sometimes Dr. Spore, but uh, only, only in emails. And I work for a program called the City Health Dashboard. And the City Health Dashboard is a publicly available uh, data website providing access to currently over 35 public health measures for 766 large US cities. The website is cityhealthdashboard.com. And our goal is to help cities across the US use data to improve health for everyone in their community. And with that, with that mission in mind, we include a whole range of health indicators, including social, those that would fit in the category of social determinants of health, like income inequality, uh, discrimin uh, racial ethnic diversity, and more classic or commonly known public health indicators like cardiovascular disease death rates or uh, teen births. Our point here is that what gets measured gets done and that without data, cities can't make informed decisions. Cities are responsible for a lot of public health policies and policies that affect public health, affordable housing, smoking policies, access to healthy food, walkability, uh, uh, maintenance of parks where trees are planted. And 
we found that especially smaller cities did not essentially have access to the essential data required to allocate resources. Cities are an especially important unit of, inner, of analysis here because they contain populations that are different than surrounding counties and they cover different geographic areas. And we're actually putting out an article in Preventing Chronic Disease today that, that sort of examines these differences. And the, you know, Gary, Indiana is an important uh, case example of this. Gary is located in uh, Lake County, which is huge and has a different population than Gary and is only a small part of the state overall. And so, so getting the, the analytic frame and the measurement frame here, getting it right is really important. And we couldn't find a data dashboard that provided data for cities publicly available. So that's where we came. In. And the main point here is that without data, cities are making decisions in the dark. So enter the city health dashboard. We, this is a dot map of all our cities. You can tell that lots of people live in California, Texas, and the Northeast. And uh, right now we have 766 cities. We're thinking always about expanding both the measures we have on the dashboard and the number of cities represented on the dashboard. It allows us to sort of pinpoint social and economic influences uh, of health outcomes. Uh, it helps to bring people around the table and give them a common language to discuss uh, successes and challenges in their communities. And then most importantly, we also provide a number of resources to help individuals make policy decisions, find funding, build collaborations in order to take action on what they find on the dashboard. So, you know, we have this slide that I, I always, <laughs> I always find kind of funny because essentially this says, if you exist, you should use the dashboard. So though it doesn't say um, uh, Greenheart webinar attendees or park advocates on here, you can just imagine, just see yourself in one of these lists and, and we'll, uh, we'll believe that I got this one right. Um, so you can use the dashboard for lots of things. Uh, one is to identify neighborhoods that may be facing specific challenges. One big advantage of the dashboard is that we not only parse our data to city boundaries, but also to neighborhood boundaries, proxying neighborhoods via census tracts. And we find that this granular data is essential, especially given the current ongoing COVID outbreak. We added a measure of COVID local risk index at the neighborhood level, and we have use cases of cities sort of targeting resources and testing using uh, this index. We also have a life expectancy measure, and you can see that small differences in place can uh, be related to large differences in life expectancy, and that's really something to think about. So we intend it as a one-stop, easy to use, uh, resource for cities, city stakeholders, and others. And uh, a couple of the measure selection criteria become really important for what I'm going to say about greenness here. Um, one is we want data for all the places on the dashboard and we want it to be rigorous. And those two sort of, sort of occupy a similar space in our process because those are check boxes for us. If we can't get that, we can't use the measure. It's important that we reflect public health priorities. And in the terms of greenness, uh, Ted made a very persuasive argument about the urgency of these greenness measures. Um, we want it to be updated regularly uh, because old data is not necessarily useful data. Um, and I'll show you the five domains in a second. The, the other really important factor here is can cities do something about this? And we face a lot of this struggle with this particular criteria with climate metrics because it's easy uh, in some ways to say, oh, it's hotter here than it used to be. And then what can a city do with that? And so the, the measure I'm going to talk about in a moment uh, sort of came out of our search for an effective climate related metric. So we have these five measures, these five categories of measures. The one that I think is most relevant for us today is the physical environment metric uh, domain. And you can see that we have park access in on the dashboard right now. And we actually 
I worked with Park Serve, the the vendor of the park access data, to uh, generalize their methods from the city level down to the census tract level. And so we are the first, and to my knowledge, only though there may be one other place that provides neighborhood level park access measures publicly uh, on a website. And so you can go to the city you're in right now, uh, if you're in a city in the US and take a look at neighborhood level park access. We also have walkability and uh, air pollution. And Ted, you and I should talk because we're getting, we're finding uh, ways to really improve the quality of our air pollution data in the near future. So we have all the measures here, but I'm gonna skip past this uh, and go straight to our uh, NDVI. This is a typo, it should be NDVI. So NDVI is a measure of greenness. And as Ted described, greenness is, is associated with improved health outcomes. And, and I think that, that, and as and Ted Hint sort of suggested this as well, access to greenness has become even more important during the pandemic when we're uh, encouraging as a public health discipline people to sort of stay inside or stay away from people. And if they're going to gather, to gather in a place where air is circulating and sunlight is, is nuking viruses. And so your proximity ability to access uh, a green place has become even more important than it used to be. Um, I, I added some of this, uh, not realizing how much of how much better a job Ted was going to do of it, but greener areas, individuals living in greener areas have lower stress and CBD risk. Proximity to greenness is associated with lower mental distress, inversely associated with air pollution. And importantly, it seems to be inversely associated with land surface temperature, which I'll tell you about a little bit more in just a moment. So, so the question becomes, how do we measure greenness if we want to provide some form of actionable and accessible measure at the city and neighborhood level of like, where are the plants? How and how many plants are near me? So what we have here is normalized difference in vegetation index. And it sort of measures coverage of green plants and to an extent health of those plants. And we get it from satellites. And as someone who generally gets data from survey instruments, getting a piece of data from a satellite makes me feel a little bit like a supervillain in a Bond movie. You know, I've got a little bit of a Dr. No thing going on. And so we just think it's the coolest thing. So our methods at NDVI, first there's a satellite. I should have done a black background here. So you really got the like vast emptiness of space vibe from it. But this is the Landsat 8 satellite. And it, uh, absorbs data in both the near infrared and red bands amongst very uh, many other uh, form wavelengths of light. And the, those observations are fed into an algorithm that calculates uh, NDVI. And what it, what it essentially does here, and, and Ted, you probably know this better than I do, so please don't hesitate. And Joy, you probably know this better than I do, so don't hesitate to correct me here. But the way I understand it is that uh, plants absorb the wavelengths of light that help them to photosynthesize, and they then emit wavelengths of light, readmit the wavelengths of light that uh, do not contribute to a photosynthesis and just heat up the plants too much and cause damage to the plant tissues. And so these two bands of light are the near infrared band and the red band. And NDVI is the near infrared minus the red divided by the total. And it's and it's converted into an index. And that index gives us a map of greenness parsed to the city and census tract level. So this is actually a slide. This is like a cartoon from that we got from NASA. And we've developed uh, NDVI measures for the dashboard in collaboration with NASA. And so they uh, can quantify how healthy a plant is based on how green uh, the, the light emitted by it may be. And so the NDVI metric uh, from negative one to zero is a dead plant and above uh, 0.66 to one is a pretty healthy plant with gradations in between. This is the granular information on the methods. We, uh, and we, what we have done is worked with NASA to develop NDVI measures for every city and census tract on the dashboard. And these are the methods we use to develop that 
uh, with NASA's assistance. They have provided us aggregated three-year estimates, and these estimates uh, are provided only for the summer months in which we expect to see peak greenness. And we did that so that we could have something that's comparable across years and places, and so that we weren't having our um, greenness measures artificially depressed by off-season uh, observations. Uh, we calculated the median of the LST across three-year periods, and you can see those three-year periods in the in top there. We have data from uh, 2015 to 2019, though there is some overlap in these data. And we take the mean of the medians, which is uh, some, you know, it's a fun phrase to say if you're into statistics, of the, of the temporarily stacked pixels in a city to get city-level averages, and the stacked pixels in the track to get a track-level average. So this is all to say, that, and we also removed um, clouds and uh, other atmospheric conditions. That's why we have so many observations to sort of sort of smooth over some of the atmospheric or weather effects. So what have we found looking at this data, right? And we have a little game, and I actually can't see the the chats here, so so I can't respond as well, if only because the PowerPoint is taking up a lot of screen space here. But I'm going to show you a number of different city maps uh, using their greenness. And I encourage you to see if you can identify the cities based ex just on their city boundaries. And these gray boxes are, are graying out the names of the places. And so in this example, what I like to think about is that we see a place that is pretty green and that, as we might expect for many developed places, greenness is uh, a, a little bit lower in the center of the city and then increases as we start to get out of town. And um, for those of you who are in, are in participating in this guessing game, this is Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana. And it, it's, got a, it's got a little funky amoeba shape. Not as bad as Houston, but still interesting. Um, so here we see a city that has a really weird municipal boundaries, and this is something you'll see if you do a bunch of uh, city data work, but also a little bit more heterogeneity in the, in the distribution of greenness, it is still more green towards the outskirts. And so for those of you who are guessing, this is Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, this has an even, this town, this city has an even more pronounced sort of uh, lesser in the center and more green on the outsides of town. And we're starting to see some pretty low greenness areas in the middle of town. And um, the I put this next to the satellite images to give you an idea of how this greenness might look uh, on, for instance, Google Maps, which I think a lot of people use, and what our greenness measures for it might be. For those of you playing at home, this is South Bend, Indiana. Now this is a city that has a uh, very low overall greenness scores. And you can see that in some of these tracks, we have almost no greenness at all, or at least it's in the bottom uh, category. And if you look at the map on the left, we can tell this is a highly developed, potentially uh, 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 inner city place that also may have substantial sprawl. And I can say that because A, I'm, from this area and be I'm cheating and I know what the what the what town it is. But I also want to highlight that in the south part of the map we've got a large industrial area that also reflects in our greenness measure as having no greenness. This is Compton, California. And then finally we have a desert town. And as you can say see there's almost no greenness here with the exception of what looks to be some very well managed parks. And this is a place where we might think about the importance of some greenness interventions. This is, uh, sorry, this is North Las Vegas. I didn't put an animation on the final gray bar, but uh, if you look up North Las Vegas on the dashboard, cityhealthdashboard.com, you'll see that these boundaries match. So actionability is perhaps the most important qualifier for a, a, a metric on the dashboard once we know it's rigorous, updated, frequently and um, nationally available. We can make an urgent our, our public health argument for green spaces using these data and the evidence Ted has shared. So then what do we suggest places do? 
places can plant trees, they can maintain their green spaces, they can tear up some asphalt. And if we're gonna think about land surface temperature, which I'm gonna give you just one slide on, they can also target EMS response and cooling stations. And uh, this is uh, Louisville, Kentucky, which I understand is a place where people drink coffee and bourbon, hopefully at different times of day. And what you can see here is that in places where there's high greenness, there's low land surface temperature, and where there's low land surface temperature, there's high greenness. And so we got both of these data sets from NASA, and we're thinking about what is most useful for the dashboard. They are strongly inversely correlated, so they express similar information, but they capture different constructs, and we're sort of, we're sort of working through that. So our next steps, we're waiting to validate the code from NASA and we're working with them. They, as with all organizations, have been slowed down by the pandemic. And we're hoping to release these metrics on the dashboard in early 2021. We probably won't do both. We're leaning towards greenness. More to come soon. And if you have any questions or thought about this, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at City Health Dashboard. And the website is cityhealthdashboard.com. You can get a lot of information there, including the ability to download most of our data if you want to use it for yourself. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Joy. Joy, I believe you're going to give us a specific understanding of some like interventions or research that we're doing, that you're doing with this. Thanks, Ben. And I'm going to shift to sharing screen. Okay, I think we have slides up now, correct? Yeah. Great, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad people can see them. I'm Joy Hart. I'm at the University of Louisville in the Department of Communication. I do work in health communication and that'll become um, important when we talk about our community partnerships um, later in the discussion. And I'm also affiliated with the Envirome Institute at the University of Louisville. And so far we've had a great bird's eye view of connections between greenness and health and connections between green equity and overall health equity. And so now we're gonna take our bird and have that bird land in its nest in a neighborhood and take a very concentrated neighborhood look at a project that we have underway at the University of Louisville. And the Green Heart Project really ask the question, what if your neighborhood could improve your health? Um, and that question I think gets community members thinking about what the possibilities are. What is the relationship between green space and health, between trees in my neighborhood and my health, my family's health, my neighbor's health. And that's important in terms of getting um, buy-in for our project and also um, educating people about the kinds of things that Ben and Ted talked about in their presentations. So as Ted previewed, the central hypothesis for the Green Heart study is that exposure to neighborhood greenness, so living in greener spaces, decreases one's risk for cardiovascular disease because of reduction in the level of air pollution. And so what are we gonna do in this project? What is it about? It is a clinical trial. And in many clinical trials, as I'm sure you know, um, there's a treatment and that treatment is often an experimental or a new medication to see how people respond to it, sort of um, the way we have trials going on with vaccines um, to um, hopefully address the COVID-19 pandemic. But in our clinical trial, the treatment is trees. So greening up neighborhoods so that people are residing in greener areas. And that maybe they get out, as Ted talked about physical activity, they get out and interface with those areas more. So in terms of starting, we needed to find out what the current state of the situation was. And this is a neighborhood study of several different neighborhoods, but um, about a four um, square mile area just south of our main university campus in the middle of the city um, on that diagram that Ben just projected. 
so one of our first steps was to find out what greenness is like in the neighborhood. What is the situation? And in terms of that, included assessments of tree species, the overall tree canopy and health there, um, and assessments of individual types of trees and tree and their health. And um, moving from there, we also needed to collect baseline health information. And so um, this part of the Green Heart Project is called our HEAL study. HEAL stands for Health Action and Environment in Louisville. And uh, Health Environment and Action in Louisville. I'll try to get the letters of HEAL in the right order. So uh, Health Environment and Action in Louisville. And so as part of that study, we had clinical events in neighborhoods where we collected data. So this was all rooted in the study area. A number of different organizations hosted these and these were for health exams and also completing some surveys. And in those health exams, um, as Ted previewed earlier, <clears throat> our primary interest was on cardiovascular health. So there were measures of blood pressure and cardiovascular disease risk and biomarkers of existing CV injury. But we also did um, lung function and body mass index and a number of um, other types of data collection. And in addition to the health data, uh, the biological data, we also collected psychosocial information with an array of different questionnaires. So um, in the presentation previewed a number of those areas. So we were looking at one's mental health. So um, anxiety, depression, level of stress, for example, but also other elements of one's life, um, how connected you felt with neighbors, how safe you felt in your neighborhood, as well as other health habits. So if you use tobacco, types and frequency, if you drink alcohol, we've mentioned bourbon a few times, so types and um, frequency for that, as well as other life areas, such as the type of work that you do, how much exercise you get, um, how much exposure to different um, types of um, environments or chemicals you might have. And then not surprisingly, we have baseline and ongoing measures of air quality. And so in this picture, you see an example of a stationary monitor. And this is part of an, an overall environmental um, monitoring um, process that we have underway. And on this particular stationary um, measure is on a utility pole. And I think that speaks to um, the partnerships of the project. We talked about a few of our partners earlier, but we have an array of partners, including uh, many organizations across the city, like our utility company that allowed us um, to use its poles for these stationary measures. Besides the stationary monitors, we do mobile monitoring periodically. So every street, every alleyway, in the neighborhoods under study. Um, and sometimes we do spot monitoring where we'll um, ask residents if we can put a stationary monitor in their backyard um, for a, a couple of weeks to find out more about air quality in a particular area. So baseline, we looked at overall health, we looked at overall air quality, and we looked at overall greenness. And then what happens after that phase of the study. Um, then that's the treatment. So we're planting thousands of trees, as many large ones as we can. And uh, several of the large ones form roadside buffers. Uh, one portion of the study area has a large freeway that runs through it. And several large trees and sets of other trees are going in there at present. And to form those roadside buffers, there was a whole design process and that's gonna be important in determining combinations that do best in terms of filtering pollutants. Um, then in addition to roadside buffers, the project engages in neighborhood planting. So plantings on residential properties. And of course, um, to get 
buy-in, we need strong relationships with community members. We have a community advisory board that's been in place for quite a while that meets regularly, shares ideas, um, helps that information filter out into the community. We go to neighborhood association meetings. We do a variety of different health screenings and health education events in the community. We work closely with school systems and other youth organizations doing everything from participating in career days, talking about careers in these areas, um, or general lesson plans on um, greenness and health or the environment in general. We have an art literature showcase every year for K through 12 students. So there's a variety of different sets of interactions that's gone on in, in that have gone on in terms of paving the way for and continuing relationships with the community. And I think that those community relationships are really our most vital ones in a project of this sort. And they also carry over into the third area of planting, which is commercial area planting. We have some additional plantings on um, public lands as well, but certainly working with the business association and, and making connections with businesses in the area has been important in um, securing permissions for planting in this area as well. And then after the treatment, so after the trees go in and some time passes, what happens next? Um, next is reevaluation of um, all the areas of the study. So we'll look again, we'll do additional waves of health data collection. So the biological measurements, we'll also look at mental health. So depression, anxiety, stress, social connections to see if there's a change in that domain. Are people interfacing with their neighbors more? What does that look like? If so, how do they feel about their communities overall? And look, of course, at the health of the trees and the level of air quality in the neighborhoods. And then what does this get us? It helps us learn how trees in urban locations can act to filter pollutants from the air. So the processes that are used there and how living in green neighborhoods more specifically affects health, including reductions of stress or improvement of mental health and increases of connected connections with others. And we're also looking at other factors such as does it change crime rates? Is there a decrease in crime because people are out interacting more with their neighbors and looking out for each other? Is there a shift in property values? And then moving back out to a bit of a bird's eye view where Ted and Ben started in terms of the global impacts, what are the possibilities of this project? We think it can create a green print to use for um, shaping future cities. It can offer new ways of preventing heart disease, as well as new paths to decreasing air pollution in cities. And all of that information can be useful in setting guidelines or policies for city design. So it can help with future cities or um, shaping existing cities in that way. And um, we think this is a project that can contribute to other city development worldwide. And as Ted mentioned in his part of the presentation, this is a connection between the natural environment and shaping the social environment and our personal environment and the interface between all of those. So in a nutshell, that's a very quick overview of the Green Heart Project. Well, I'll jump in. That was a great presentation. Um, we've, we've carved out a little extra time for questions that we get, and I'm gonna be so bold as to maybe merge some together. I know we have some folks here from drier climates, our desert communities, our high plains, We've talked a lot about, it's, it feels like the uh, Eastern deciduous forest and our, our pretty green trees that do our pretty green stuff. We're spoiled back here. What's the insight? What's the lesson, um, you know, kind of riff on what do you do if you're a desert city, if you're a Boise, if you're a Phoenix, 
Um, how does this all intersect? How are they greener when they're naturally brown? I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> so, um, well, the easy thing is to move to Louisville. So uh, if, if you're not willing to do that, then, um, you know, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is we are just at the infancy of our understanding of um, all of these factors. And so people who live in different eco regions around the world, um, arguably, you know, um, need to be in somehow um, in concert, you know, physiologically with their environment. So you get into a much more sort of esoteric discussion about, you know, uh, lands of origin of people and your physiology, you know, could very well be shaped by an ecology that you had a long, long time ago, right? And so it may, it may be at the end of the day, when we're all done figuring this out, it may be that there are people that are absolutely healthiest in arid climates or absolutely healthiest on rocky shorelines. You know, I mean, this is, uh, I think we have to be prepared for um, this kind of much larger uh, relationship between people and, and uh, a natural ecology. All I can tell you is that there's been a lot of research done on greenness. There's been some research done on blueness, people who live near water. Um, but you know we're we're focused on really getting to the bottom of a, a, a clinical understanding of nature, so that we can um, you know sort of take it from the sidelines as a as a cocktail party thing, as a you know a fun thing to talk about, and and try to really if those are real real health benefits like like a medication would have, then let's start taking it very seriously, like we do with uh, medications and other kinds of clinical interventions. So. It's a long-winded answer. I mean, maybe we'll get to desert treatments at some point in time, but um, we're going to start with uh, greenness on our side. Ben, Joy, do you all have anything you want to follow up with on that? Uh, a question about tree survival. I know that's a big issue here in Louisville, but all of our legacy cities and across Europe as well. Um, maybe riff a little bit again. Uh, impacts, understandings of the value of a mature tree a street tree as it would be versus a juvenile or younger. Um, is there any information you can give that, that will redouble the efforts to protect our older canopy trees in an urban setting? Any insights you can share with our audience there? I'll take a shot at that one. So, um, you know, I think what we the lesson we've learned from uh, agriculture globally is, um, you know, monocultures are are, are not good things, <laughs> and so as we as we take this seriously, I think we have to think again in ecological terms, right? So it's it's not any one tree species, tree size, you know, bush, you know, whatever that um, you know it, it is it likely like all things um, much more nuanced than that. So you know we we do think about plant communities. And if you think about plant communities, you know, you have to accommodate uh, plants that are in different stages of life and, you know, how that all, how that natural sustainable system functions. Um, you know, we, we've done a, a pretty lousy job, in my opinion, in a lot of cities, you know, essentially using nature as ornaments, right? And we, we talk a lot about lollipop trees in cities, right? If you line a street with, you know, trees that the utility companies like and everybody sort of finds in, uh, unoffensive, you know, when we look at air pollution, we find those are the worst trees. I mean, you'd be better off not having lollipop trees on your streets because they actually trap air pollution at nose level in most cases. And so, um, you know, I, I think we have to have a more fundamental respect for, you know, kind of how we're approaching nature, especially in cities and, and really take principles of ecology, at, you know, as they work out in the wilderness and, and really think about how they work in cities. We had a question both from Canada and then from Luis down in Mexico uh, for Latin America. Ben, is there NDVI data available for, for Latin America or for Canada that can be deployed? Because now you have park people totally dorking out on satellites. So, you know, this, this gets very exciting to us. Yeah. Um, so there, you guys are not the only people totally dorking out on satellites. I'm with you on the enthusiasm. My project does not currently have NDVI data for places outside of the cities on the dashboard. However, there's there's not um, a, a legal reason that I'm aware of that people cannot calculate NDVI for the places they're interested in. The, um, the methods, the, the resource used to calculate NDVI is Google Earth Engine, which recently became publicly available. 
the limitations there are that you you need to know somebody who has the programming skills in Google Earth Engine, and also that it's a truly massive amount of data that takes time and patience to calculate. And so um, I think the components of these data sets are available, and there is a data access barrier that um, is sort of a, a different but related question, which is how do we, uh, to borrow a phrase, liberate the data so that people can use it in Canada and Latin America and wherever else they may want to make an argument for green spaces. Great, that's helpful. Interesting question. Um, we haven't talked about critters and, and the impact of critters on our well-being, um, but also maybe some of the conflict that comes into green spaces in cities and maybe some of the undesirable critters have. Has, have you guys explored any of the wildlife implications or even better, does be, we, we know that this is a setup, so swing away, softball. Seeing wildlife makes our lives better is, <laughs> I'll just say that we believe that. Um, have you uncovered any data that has proven that true? And have you had kind of gotten into that wildlife controversy thing in the urban setting at all? Well, one of the ancillary studies we have for the Green Heart Project is um, a biodiversity audit. And every uh, summer, uh, uh, we have some graduate students from Murray State University who show up and they do a full survey at, I want to say, 80 locations across four neighborhoods uh, where they are looking at bugs, birds, and bats. And um, it's, a, it's a classic biodiversity audit. And um, while it doesn't directly answer the question, how much do we like to see uh, critters, as you so colloquially say, um, it definitely will help us get a little closer to, you know, is it more than the plants that we're planting? And, um, you know, I, for one, imagine that it is about more than that. And, you know, I, I'm, as, I'm as interested as the next person in, you know, whether the wildlife we encourage to, uh, you know, live with us in cities is gonna be welcome in all cases. But I do think, you know, if, if we don't have an understanding of that interdependence, I mean, it's, it, it's as bad as monoculture. Like if we just look at plants and we say it's all about the plants, then we're missing it again, right? And so I think we're gonna have to get a little more comfortable with a little bit more wildlife in cities than people um, maybe are used to thinking about. And I think specifically in the Greenheart neighborhoods, we don't yet know what the community members are going to think about um, some of the wildlife that may return with more trees, but they have been very interested in um, looking at the bugs and the birds and the bats in those biodiversity studies. Um, so it, it seems like people are interested and excited about possibilities there. Of course, we all know that people tend to gravitate toward cute critters um, and may be less attracted to things like earthworms if they don't find those cute or people have a different view. I, I love bats, but people have different views on their comfort level with bats. So maybe we're going to learn more about that with the interface of the project over time as well. Hey, Joy, I want to stick with you for a second because this is an area we're circling around, but the, the issue of gentrification has been raised. Um, the issue of, of ecology sensitivity in our economically distressed and disadvantaged communities is, is clearly a back narrative on this. Can you maybe share some of your lessons and learnings on communicating the value of e green ecology in communities where you know, there are bigger challenges than maybe the trees and health that we're dealing with? What, what advice would you give to us on the front lines? You're muted. I'm sure you're saying yeah. wonderful things. There you I'm, go. Yeah, I'm seeing that across my screen as I'm talking. You're <laughs> muted. So oh, sorry about that. Um, yes, that's a great question. And um, we have some work. Ted might want to talk about um, this as well that's um, recently started in this area. But I will say that before work started in the Green Heart neighborhoods, we did focus groups and community conversations with people to find out about their communities and views on their communities. And um, these, this is a lower income area of the city. There are several challenges in the area. And we heard things like, we, we don't necessarily need trees, we need crime to stop or 
how about less drugs rather than more trees or I'm not sure I want to rake more leaves. So I think across time, um, people have become more aware of the benefits and more interested in even looking, you know, we also do work in translating existing research. So sharing findings that it, I think the assumption starting out for a lot of people might be that if there are bushes or trees that might increase crime because it might provide places for people to hide, but there are ways in which studies have found that um, greater greenery decreases crime. So it is a longer process and a longer connection. Another thing that we tried um, to do and to share with people is um, that we have funding for a particular project, but we are open to working on other projects and helping secure resources there. So we have tried to build partnerships and help the community secure support for other areas of concern also. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'd love to throw in the one point. It is a clinical trial, as Joyce said. And um, one of the important things to know about a longitudinal clinical trial is you need people to stay in the area for, for the research to work. And so owner occupancy is an important variable in the neighborhoods we pick. And so you brought up the word gentrification. Gentrification, I think most of us understand is most problematic in very, very high rental areas where people can be easily displaced as neighborhoods are improved. Now I'm not here to say we don't have any renters because we certainly have a bunch of renters, but um, you know, it is one factor. I'm hoping if, if, if there is any kind of improvement that, that causes those kinds of concerns, it certainly is a consideration that, you know, um, property owners, you know, who live there will be the beneficiaries of those. So we're not outside developers. We're, not, we're just a bunch of scientists. We're using, you know, non-developer money to go do a science experiment. And I hope that if there's any improvement or value that grows, it will accrue to people who own property there and live there. That's great. We are, we are coming near the end of our time. So I wanna give an opportunity um, the, I tell you, the positivity from the questions and y'all's presentation could not be more needed at this moment. And I want to thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of negativity. Just to hear this positive vision of what can be and how your work can help us. I can't tell y'all how much that means uh, professionally. If folks want to connect with y'all, um, what's the best way to dial in? What's the best way to stay um, connected to y'all? As you, you're giving us great selling points and great data we can deploy. What are your recommendations for them, for the audience? I'm never sure if email is our enemy or our friend, but these types of emails we love. So I think reaching out by email with, with questions or um, other ways to connect would be great. Yeah, I'll say that I'm sure email is my enemy, <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean I don't want to hear from you all. And so I'm dropping my email in chat. I will add mine there yeah. as well. I will absolutely add Dr. Hart's email to the chat. <laughs> no, I mean, you can write to me too. That's right. Well, Ben, you're in trouble because your narrative, your your story of moving to a greener part of New York City is now going to become um, a story repeated throughout our community. So you're now, you're screwed. Um, you're yeah. in. I mean, there, there are worse reasons to hear from people. <laughs> I'm okay with this. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for your time. Um, this has been wonderful. And thank you, everyone that attended and tuned in. I uh, really appreciate that. We'll get the uh, reading list out to you because we're all dorks and we like books. Um, and maybe a music list just to show what we do in quarantine uh, here as well. So thank all of you for your time. Um, and stay tuned for that email follow-up. And appreciate our speakers again. Many thanks. Thank thanks, everyone. You. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.